Everyone here is talking about China, the reopening, how much it's going to juice the global economy. When is it going to affect commodity prices in the way people have been predicting? It could be coming, Lisa. Uh, I've met with some people from China even today, and uh, what they tell me is the pandemic has largely moved through the big cities. Uh, people are back at work. Uh, the economy is beginning to move forward. We're not really seeing it in commodity markets yet, but the absence of that demand is one of the reasons why we've seen prices soften, and the return of that demand is what could start to firm them up again. Although some people say that China is getting all of their supplies geared up from Australia Australia, from coal, from all sorts of different supplies. They have huge stockpiles that they're going to unleash to dampen any kind of sudden surge in demand. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, the data out of certain parts of the world is a little bit harder to interpret than others. And China sometimes That's diplomatic. <laughs> is, um, is a little bit difficult to see in the short term what's happening. But clearly, in the longer term, we can see that oil demand out of China has been down here during the pandemic. And, um, and, and they will use coal, they'll use liquefied natural gas, but they'll use oil as well. And, uh, and as their economy does return to full strength, I think we will see it in demand in a world that's pretty tight right now. And so that's the, I think that's the case for some upside in commodity prices this year is a strong return of the Chinese economy. How much upside could that be? It's really hard to say. I, we, we try not to predict prices because you're always wrong. Uh, what I will say is that supply and demand are uh, fairly finely balanced. And, and post the pandemic, as economies have opened, supply has been struggling to keep up, which is why even before the war began, we, start, we, we saw some strength in prices. And we have markets now that are constrained by uh, rules on who can sell to, wh which countries can buy from, from other countries, what prices things can transact at. So shipping legs are longer than they were before. There's a lot of strain on these markets, and it wouldn't take uh, a big surge from China to really start to, to push against some of those constraints. Because of some of those concerns and some of the frictions that you're talking about, have you changed where you do some of your production, where you focus some of Chevron's drilling and, and exploration? We really haven't. Those are long-term decisions that we make based on a long-term view on supply, demand, technology. In the short term, we need to be nimble with logistics, uh, with the way that we manage uh, supply relationships with our customers in order to try to be sure that we meet our obligations. So there's a lot of uh, commercial activity and logistics activity to respond to the kinds of things that we're talking about. But the long-term uh, decisions are made on uh, you know, the fundamentals of the geology, the markets, and, and, and uh, a long-term view of those things. Do investors reward you more for investing in production in a way that they hadn't a couple of years ago simply because of suddenly this renewed focus on fossil fuels after they've been left for dead? Certainly our sector for the last decade uh, has uh, not performed like the rest of the market. And, uh, and some of that was, I think, a lack of capital discipline by companies in our sector. Some of it was the narrative that oil and gas were going away sooner than they, than they likely will. And uh, we certainly saw last year the sector perform very strongly. And I do think that investors have uh, you know, reacquainted themselves with the fundamentals of the energy business, with the cash that, that companies generate in this sector. Uh, we We've, uh, by the end of the third quarter last year, had, had generated record cash in our business. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, there's more capital discipline. I think the demand is there. And I do think the market is beginning to uh, come back to us. But what I'll say is, you know, Earnings in our sector uh, through three quarters of 2022 represented 10% of S&P 500 earnings. By market capitalization, it's only 5% of the S&P 500. So I think there's still upside. You know, earlier this year, earlier last year, the Biden administration came out and said, we're going to lower prices as, as gasoline prices surged. We're going to do these releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Do you think that was a good policy? You know, I think it, uh, it certainly provided oil supply to a world that was concerned about the reliability of oil supply. Uh, the reserve wasn't really set up uh, for price uh, excursions. It was set up for true supply outages, which we didn't experience last year. Uh, so the, the risk in having used the supplies the way they've been used is if we were to run into something that is more serious in terms of the availability of supply, there's not as much dry powder left as, as there has been for the last several decades. So it's, it's run things lower. Uh, I think it did have a, a bit of a calming effect on markets. 
markets, uh, but it's left us in a little bit more of a, a delicate situation. And now they're saying that they're going to potentially repurchase uh, at around $70. Perhaps they've missed that, but they might start refilling it uh, come February. Is this the role of the government? I mean, to sort of set a, a floor, is that basically what they've done? It's very interesting, uh, the amount of intervention we've seen governments um, engage in into markets that historically they really have, have allowed to function uh, on market fundamentals. Uh, my personal view is that um, uh, a price that the government says will refill the SPR at, at this price doesn't change investment decisions for our company. Uh, if we want to sell our barrels in the future at a certain price, we can go to financial markets and do that today. So uh, these kinds of things won't change the way that we invest. I, I can't speak for other companies in our industry. Do you think that this could potentially affect pricing next year if there is a push to refill or that, that pressure uh, on the other side of supplies coming into the market is not there. I mean, are you expecting that to kind of change the dynamic in a way that the market isn't fully reflecting at this time? Well, it would certainly be incremental demand in the market that would be buying the commodity, which has been selling it uh, over the last year. Uh, my guess is, uh, and I don't have any unique information here, is that the government will refill slowly over time and, uh, and that it won't come in, in in a large surge, but in a more uh, measured way uh, that will, you know, probably be something the market can handle. A lot of people are talking about this renewed focus on fossil fuels and energy companies being their top bet for this year. So suddenly people are absolutely flooding back and saying, you know, perhaps we got carried away with ESG. Have you stopped investing quite as much in some of the renewables? Are you emphasizing that even more as sort of energy security? How are you playing that given that the dynamic, the conversation has shifted? Our strategy has been to uh, leverage our strengths to provide lower carbon energy to a growing world. And so we're spending the same uh, money, we're investing in the same technologies, we're working on the same kinds of projects in our new energies business, renewable fuels, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, uh, technologies like geothermal. Uh, again, we take a long-term view on, uh, on markets and, and on investment. And so the uh, I think the dialogue being reset, and, and I wouldn't say it's fully reset, but it had become uh, very polarized. And what, what I've been arguing for is a more balanced approach that recognizes the importance of affordability, recognizes the importance of reliable supply for, for national security reasons, and protects the environment. And an approach both from governments and from companies that balances these out. And, and that's what we've certainly been trying to do. Just lastly, I'm curious about some of the sanctions that have been put on Russian oil, and some of which are going to come online come next month, particularly around diesel mm -hmm. in Europe. How much do you think that's been priced in? How much is that going to be an additional price shock? Markets are certainly forward-looking. This has been telegraphed for, for quite some time. And so I think that uh, just as we saw when the oil price cap and the European sanctions came in, uh, the market was generally prepared. I think people anticipate it. Uh, the, the risk is unintended consequences. And products tend to move in smaller quantities uh, to local markets. Uh, not moving uh, a steady source of supply into Europe means that supply will go to more distant markets and Europe will have to find their supply from new markets. And so I think some of that is underway. More of it uh, is likely to follow. So there is the risk for some disruptions.